Hello and welcome to Arvis of Harbour. It is October, or the end of October, and so this month we got through quite a lot. I think it's interesting that the way that I read this month, I kind of alternated between rather easy books and rather difficult books, and I think what I will end up doing, if I find the time, is actually talk through some of my reflections on literary difficulty, because I think books can be difficult or challenging for lots of different reasons, and if a book is difficult in an unpleasurable, unpleasant way, then I don't feel like anyone should be obligated to read it. But yeah, I think that's something that'd be more interesting for another discussion. Right now, we'll look at the books. So on the easy side, we've got... Wow. Ah, these four. That was a terrible idea. Why did I do that? And then there are the four difficult books that I've got here. So there's no clap today. Maybe I'll just do this and... Right. Book one for October was Silas Marnon by George Eliot. And I'm slowly working my way up to reading these infamous, enormous old books, and Middlemarch is definitely one of them. And one of my thoughts was that I would read the shortest of the George Eliot novels, Silas Marnot, to try and get a sense of her style, and try to figure out what I would need to be ready for to understand Middlemarch. And I thought that this would be easy, because it's tiny, right? This is only like a hundred or so pages. It was not easy, and I think the thing that makes this so difficult was because it's a book set in provincial England, and the values and social structure of provincial England is just very alien to what I'm familiar with. I think just the kinds of assumptions they have about morality and society are just bizarre. And we're following Silas Mano, a title character, who is a master seamster? See? I was gonna say seamstress, but I don't know if this is a gendered term. A uh, seam person, right? And so he makes clothes. And he originates from this really big and bustling city, but he has this rival, and his rival falls in love with someone that he was in love with. And he's framed, and he's kicked out of the city, and he's in exile. And this happens in the first two chapters, right? And then we get this slow, burgeoning description of him slowly gaining the trust of a small township, and becoming known for his seeming, I really don't know what to call it, weaving, I guess, and his interactions with the other people there. Now, this is difficult because of the plot structure. The plot structure is just not what you would expect from any conventional narrative. It takes until, I would have said, about 70% of the text to even know what the problem is going to be. and. As someone who was much more used to conventional novels and conventional storytelling, expecting a complication was really difficult here, because of course the beginning and the inciting incident is Silas Mana losing his fortune and his reputation and being exiled into the small town, but when we get to the small town we start to meet everybody who lives there, we meet these two brothers who are in a strange social situation, they're the richest and most powerful members of the society, but the younger brother is just this absolute scoundrel who gambles and messes with everybody and gets into huge debts. And the older brother is a person who is secretly engaged to this woman that he doesn't like, and so he's kind of blackmailed into all his behavior. And you're just sitting there wondering, well, what relevance does this have to Silas Mana, the character who I was interested in, right? And even the blub of this text basically spoils the later part of this novel, which is that eventually, like a very long time into the novel, the protagonist starts taking care of this young orphan girl, and then the question is raised of what is valuable to Silas. Is it being able to regain his original reputation, or is it this new life and this new uh, equilibrium that he has created raising this young woman? That's effectively the whole story, right? I feel like I've just spoiled the entire thing by saying that because it takes so long to get there. And the entire time just going, this is set up and this is more set up and this is vague descriptions of the, well not vague, extremely detailed descriptions of English provincial life and I'm just kind of sitting there going, well what's the point? You know, where am I gonna get something to latch onto? And it takes until almost the end of the novel to get to that. So would I recommend this? Honestly, no. Honestly, it the experience of this, I feel like you could just read a summary of it online and get the same experience. I feel like the while the characters were very well realized, there are just so many instances where they're just in a pub having a conversation about things that aren't relevant to what I would call the overall narrative of this text. And unless you are the kind of person who 
wants that, I think you'll have a very hard time with this book, even though it is so short. And so I've given a two out of five, and I don't know how I'm going to feel going into Middlemarch. I realize that the difference between an author's short books and their long books is also very immense. So I'm definitely going to try and get around to it, but I will say this is very difficult, and I did not enjoy it. All right, book two of October. This was my genre of the month. This is Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I did not realize how this series worked before I got into it, but it's actually adapted from a radio play. And so the radio play's narrative was already pretty set in stone by the time this novel was being written, which meant that these novels are very short, breezy, almost recaps of what was in the radio play. And the narrative structure here is also really weird. So we follow... I want to say his name's Arthur Dent. Yes, Arthur Dent is a very ordinary name who wakes up one morning to realize that his house is about to be bulldozed. And as a disgruntled English middle-class man, he decides, no, I can't believe that the government bureaucracy would not have told me about this, right? And so he keeps all the fuss, only to find out that his best friend has actually been an alien the entire time. And the entirety of Earth is also about to be bulldozed. And so they whisk themselves away into the spaceship that was being stolen by a intergalactic political entertainment figure figurehead and they go off in such a crazy adventure and it's interesting because this is a science fiction universe that just has a huge amount of irreverence for everything it's got that biting british humor that is just poking fun at society putting its characters into absolute misery and having a great time doing it and so it's really hard to describe the experience of it because it's just so fast and so frenetic, frenetic and it's just not quite like any other science fiction that I've been accustomed to. I think this is a great book if you are the kind of person who doesn't like a lot of world building self-serious nonsense in their sci-fi. This is just a real takedown of that kind of attitude but it also predates the science fiction genre to a large extent. I think this was from the the mid 70s, the late 70s, so a lot of the tropes in science fiction just hasn't really been codified yet. And this is also a pretty fun adventure novel. They go in search of treasure, they go to this abandoned planet, they go to, I guess, find out the secret of the universe, and there's a lot of hypothesizing about what the secret of the universe could possibly be. There was lots of jokes, I laughed all the way through, and the pacing is just so, so fast as well. The annoying thing, though, is the ending is very much a sequel hook, so this book then follows on immediately after with the restaurant at the end of the universe and then a bunch of other things. There are a lot of science fiction concepts in here that have been very fun, and if you like the genre, I think that you definitely owe it to yourself to read this. This is a great counterpart to some of the more self-serious science fiction genres, which I'm sure are also good, but you've got to have some of that brevity in your life sometimes as well. So this is getting a 4 out of 5. Book 3 for October. This is Midnight's Children by Salman Rushdie. Ah, oh, this took me so long to get through. This was a, a difficult read of a difficult read. So I made my spreadsheet ranking the difficulty of all the books that I've read in my entire life. And this one is at the very top. It's difficult for so many reasons. It is just a very hard text. The premise of this book is that on the eve of Indian independence, a thousand children are born on that midnight, leading to this title. And each of those children has a kind of supernatural power that is bestowed upon them because of the historic importance of this moment. And our protagonist is born on the very stroke of midnight. He's one of two children born on the stroke of midnight. And so he has the strongest powers, which is, he's got telepathy and he's also got like strong empathy and he's also just got a very strange physical appearance. That makes it sound cool, right? That makes it sound like Indian political magic realism X-Men it's not that book. It is a dense metaphorical exploration of Indian geopolitics that has some fun superpowery stuff inside. And the structure is just a horrible, hideous mess that is so hard and so tangled. And the experience of reading this book is just your mind needs to be working so hard to try and figure out what's happening and why it's happening. It's audacious, which I think some people might like, and it is a huge prize winner, right? It won the 19, 1981 Booker Prize, and it won the Retroactive Booker Prize of the Booker Prize winners. So people love this book. People know so much about this book. 
but it, the experience of reading it is just so difficult. You need a notebook, you need a dictionary, you need a cultural guide to India, you need just so much supplementary stuff to make even any sense of it. And I will explain one thing the book does. The book itself doesn't explain it until midway through, but it's so important to understanding it. The protagonist explains how this narrative works on four levels. And if I were to draw like a quadrant on the screen here, there's the literal and the metaphorical, or the literal and the figurative, and there's also the active and the passive. And so the active literal is something like the protagonist making a direct statement about the state of Indian politics. It's something that is meant to be understood on Facebook. And then the active metaphorical is when the protagonist is still stating something direct about the Indian geopolitics, but they're doing it using a symbol or a metaphor instead of being literal. And then you go to the next quadrant, which is the passive literal. And this is where incidental details of the story without directly being about Indian geopolitics are still saying something about ge Indian geopolitics. And then we go to the passive metaphorical, which is when incidental symbols and metaphors happen to be meaningful to Indian geopolitics. Most significant plot points of this book, especially the concept of children being born at midnight, are meaningful in more than one of these quadrants. In fact, the premise of the children being born at midnight, I would say, is meaningful in all four of these quadrants. So you could read this book effectively four times, paying attention to a different one of these modes of communication, and come away with a different interpretation. It is so, so dense. And it also takes 130 pages to get to the protagonist's birth. So we get go through the entire history of the protagonist's grandparents, and then their parents, and then their uncles and aunties, and then the strange circumstances of their birth. And all through this time, we're getting flash forwards. We're getting hints to things that will happen in the future, even when we have no clue who the protagonist is or what's going to happen in the future. It is just... The first 130 pages were so hard to get through. I was getting through maybe 40 pages a day because I was reading it so slowly, I had to keep looking up so many things. One thing that I found was a bit easier for me was that I'd already read a few books set in India. I'd read uh, The White Tiger by Aravind Abdiga, I'd read The God of Small Things by Arundhati Roy, I'd read A Passage in India by Ian Forster, and uh, Interpretive Maladies by Jhumpal Hiri. I'd read lots of different Indian authors who write about India in different ways, and it meant some of the jargon, the language, or the political ideas I'd already kind of known about. So when I encountered them in this book, and what was very helpful is that this is a second-hand copy where the previous owner had underlined or highlighted all of the words that they were unfamiliar with. And so I could see them and go, this is something that I at least know a little bit about because of the reading I've done in the past. And this is also a hugely intertextual, metafictive book. It makes references to the Indian classic, the Indian classics, so the Rama... Ramayana and the, um, the Mahab Mahabharata. It also makes reference to the Quran. It makes reference to classic, other classic works of Indian literature and world literature. And you need to be very knowledgeable and well-read to make the most of this book. It's just a lot. It's just a lot. It's, it's epic in the way that something monumental is epic. It just the experience of it is just so, so much. And unfortunately, it doesn't have the immediate appeal of something that you can read quickly, right? Even though it's got this fun premise of superpowers and magic realism, you can't enjoy the book on that level. The only way you enjoy the book is if you sit down with a notebook and you really try to iron out all the historical references and everything that's going on. Otherwise, you'll be reading this and going, I have no clue what's going on. I have no clue what the point of any of these moments are. I don't understand what's real and what's fictional. It's just, ugh, it's, it's, ah. My brain is still fried from reading this. I don't know what to give it. I've given it a 3 out of 5. That is my experience of reading it so far. I think what will probably end up happening is I will read more, and I will read more Indian literature in particular, and potentially know more about the history as well, and maybe, very rarely, one day come back to this book and see if I can make more sense of it. But until then, I'm going to set it aside because the amount of anguish I've experienced by reading this is just incomparable. It's, it's so difficult, it's so dense, I was so confused. 
and I had to do so much supplementary research to try and trudge my way through this first reading of this book. So that was Midnight's Children. Okay, and immediately after that book, I wanted something quick and light, and I read Before the Coffee Gets Cold by uh, Toshi Kazu Kawaguchi. This has been blowing up on the internet, and this is something that I finished in a single day because it's so quick and easy. This is actually adapted from theatre, and I wish I didn't know that before I read it because the moment I found that out, I started to judge it based on the fact that it's a theatrical adaptation. So many choices of the narrative started to make more sense because it was a theatrical adaptation. It's a, it's a bottle episode of a book. Everything happens in a single set, which is this tiny little dive cafe in Tokyo where the premise is there is a table with a ghostly woman who's sitting there reading a book the entire time. And when she goes to the bathroom, a person can sit where she is sitting, order a coffee, and be transported back to a historical point in their lives while they're still in the cafe. So if they can, if they've visited the cafe with someone else in the past, they can speak to them again. They can talk to them again. The only rule is that they can't influence the future by changing the past. So, so there's no like Ray Bradbury, Sound of Thunder, Chaos Theory thing going on here. They can speak to someone in the past and find out information, but they can't change the future or the present. And also they, they get a very limited amount of time. They can only speak until their coffee gets cold and they get either whisked back to the future when they finish drinking it, or they are stuck as a ghost in the past realm. So that's the premise. We meet a small cast of characters who frequent this cafe, and there are four episodes which involve different characters going back in time for different reasons, try and find out things about people that they were in love with or with family members or who want to give a last message to someone who's passed away. I thought the, ep the episode structure of this text worked and also reminded me a lot of theatre because there's a clear act structure here. The first act kind of introduces the rules of this time travel, the second act elaborates on it and it's exploring the ways these characters interact with the past with these rigid set of rules that the cafe has established. It's a very melodramatic book. I find that every situation is couched in this extreme melodrama of just sad things that can happen to people and the book is really really trying to make you feel that sadness but not in a genuine way not in a way where the words themselves are written to elicit that emotion but instead i find the book is just reminding you of things that are by definition quite sad and hoping that you will feel that through this time traveling gimmick and i it, to be honest it kind of worked because it's fast, and because you read it quickly, and because you understand these characters so simply, you do feel it. And I walked away with a strong emotional impression from each of these sections. I think because they chose to write about quite dramatic situations, and because the time travel gimmick allowed the melodrama to seep out very naturally. I did find that the prose was a bit stilted, I thought the dialogue was very good, but the descriptions of characters was a little robotic. I found that it was very often that a character would say something and then the dialogue would be re-described in the prose that happens immediately after. And so it's something that just made me want to read faster and get through it. If I ever saw something double described, I would just kind of skim through it and keep going faster and faster. And so I finished this in, I think, about two or three hours. It's a very quick book, so if you're someone who hasn't read for a while and wants to get into something easy, I would recommend this. It works well. It's not perfect, certainly. It didn't really change my life, but there are things that I like about it, and so I give it a 3 out of 5. Alright, and next one after that one was Heat and Light by Ellen Van Nieven. This was interesting. This was... I had no idea what this was going into it, but I'm really glad that I read it. So Ellen Van Nieven is an Aboriginal Australian poet, and I know her name because in 2017, one of her poems from the collection Comfort Food was selected as part of the New South Wales HSC English paper. And people did not get it, and people did not like that poem. And people, by people I mean like entitled Angry Teenagers, right? And so they got on the internet and started messaging the author and complaining about it. And there was this big cover and I felt very bad for Van Nieven because no one should be subjected to that because they were trying to write. I feel like that 
text that poem was taken so out, so out of context and put into an educational context in which no student would have truly appreciated it because they were being subjected to an exam that involved it. And so I thought that was very unkind to the works that appear in that paper. And it was nice of this opportunity to be able to look at her work and understand how it functions. Now, this is a collection of three short... Oh, it's three short story collections. It's hard to describe. It's three sections. So there is the first section called Heat, and these are interconnected short stories about one family known as the Cressingers and how trauma has worked its way through the various generations and how patterns repeat. And I quite liked these stories in Heat. I found that discovering the family and their connections was really fascinating. It was great to see a story where you saw that one character had maybe something dark behind the, their exterior or maybe had some kind of trauma they're working through and that was just a fixture of the rest of the family's life like everyone just kind of knew to adapt to it and then later in a different story you would actually be more intimate with that character you would know what they went through and you would piece it all together you would have this complex and rich understanding of a family that we would normally never have in our everyday lives and i just enjoyed that first section so much i thought it worked very well the second section is called water and this is an extended science fiction short story that's very, very political, and I found it so fascinating. It's about the future Australian government deciding to terraform some islands off the coast of Australia and make them specifically for Aboriginal Australian people. But what ends up happening is in that terraforming process, there are plants that become sentient and be, become able to become like people and could speak and have their own conversations. And it's about the government regulatory body that is there to control the plant life and to try and figure out what kind of relationship should there be between the humans and the plants. And there's lots of mirrors there between the relationship between the government and the plant and the relationship between our current Australian government and Aboriginal Australian communities, historically and in the present. And there's so much to say here. And it's also so enchanting the way that this allegory works because it is at the same time very unexpected and alien, but also very familiar, the kinds of power dynamics that we see at play. And being able to look at it from a fictionalized angle makes it all the more real in a sense. So I really liked Water as well. I thought that was great. And the last connect collection is Light. And this is about 10 or so disparate short stories about the experience of being Aboriginal and the experience of being queer around uh, city and regional Australia. These stories, to me, were more hit and miss. Some of them were very small sketches that were just trying to illustrate one tiny moment in an individual's life or an individual's relationship with someone else. And so you never really know what you were going to get. You didn't know if the characters were going to recur or if there's going to be some kind of larger theme being communicated or if it was just this incidental, oh, look at this person for a bit. Okay, we're going to move on. There was one great stand-up story, which also gives the collection its cover, which is about uh, a young girl and her friend who go and find an abandoned ferris wheel in just the middle of the desert. And I thought that symbol was just so evocative and so vivid in my mind. But some of the other stories are just a bit more sparse. I went back and glanced at each of these as I was doing my preparation for this video, and a lot of them I would look at the title and think, I don't really remember what the story was about, I don't remember what happened in it. There was not as much significance that I could ascribe to any of those individual stories that I could to the ones in Heat or the overarching story in Water. It's interesting though. It's a good experiment into the style, and there are lots of really great things to say about individual stories in this collection. I would have liked maybe more focus, so maybe Water could have been its own full novel and I would have loved it, or maybe uh, Heat could have been its own larger collection of stories. I hate to say, like, Tim Linton's Atoning, but that's the one reference that I can make for Australian readers. A bigger interconnected collection, and I would have loved that too. So, I don't really like to critique books based on what I would have wished them to be. I can only say that for what I have read here, I would give it a 3 out of 5 with some glimpses of just incredible brilliance there. So that's getting light. All right.
the next hard book that I read in October is Possession by A.S. Myatt. I knew nothing about this and based on the cover, it's the kind of cover that you'd be kind of embarrassed to read on the train because you assume it's going to be quite steamy, right? It's going to be one of those books with really uh, vivid descriptions of sex and intimacy and this was not that. This was instead an incredibly traditionalist stuffy book about Victorian poetry and two researchers who find out a secret relationship between two otherwise unconnected Victorian poets through letter correspondence and it allows that the, poet, the poetic works of those two poets to be reconsidered over time and to mean different things. So suddenly poems that people had assumed to be about a certain thing are now about moments in their relationship. And this is a huge, complex, messy book. It, I almost want to compare it to Midnight's Children, but they function in very different ways. Midnight's Children is a postmodern life story integrating history and fantasy and personal experience. And Possession is a almost DIY scrapbook uh, conspiracy theory of a novel, which contains everything, right? It contains false journal articles, it contains poetry that is written by fictional poets, it contains letter correspondence, it contains present tense conversations, speeches given to academic bodies, just lots of supplementary materials woven together for the reader to produce at their own pace and try to, pay, to piece their own story together. It's just such a weird experience to me. And I didn't get it at the beginning. I didn't really see what was so significant about it. I think part of it is also because I don't have a very strong tie to poetry, but specifically Victorian era poetry. There's not one Victorian poet who I love so much that I would want to read their letter correspondence. That to me just seems really strange. And to have stakes on that, to have characters who have devoted their entire lives to studying one individual poet to the point that they are having interpersonal troubles and conflicts because of other people who also happen to want to write about that poet, to me just seems really silly and really petty. And I cannot imagine anybody, not even my academic friends, acting like this, right? It just seems bizarre to me. And I didn't really enjoy this book until I encountered some of the poetry that A.S. Wyatt wrote for it. And that blew everything out of the water. I think the poetry here is just genuinely fantastic. And it's even better when you consider it in the lens of this is a author in the nine in the eighties, I think the eighties, the nineteen eighties, or the nineteen nineties, writing fictional Victorian era poetry and absolutely nailing it. Each of the poems functions within the context of Victoriana, but also in the context of our modern day, communicating values that are interesting to authors in the nineties and for postmodern audiences, but being wholly believable in the style and language of the Victorian poets, except just a little bit easier, right? There's not as much of the classical classicism, there's not as much of the difficult vocabulary or the inverted syntax. The poetry is easy to understand, but it is so clearly evocative of that era that if you chuck this in a book alongside Tennyson and Rossetti and Browning, it would be hard to pick out. It would be hard to pick out those poems and go, these were clearly not written in the 1800s. So hats off to A.S. Wyatt, that was really, really cool. <sighs> Did it make me want to read the letter correspondence though? No. And that's one of the things I hated about Possession, is that every now and then I would flip forward a few pages and see, oh, we've got a letter section coming up. And we're gonna have to read 50 pages of back and forth letter correspondence between these two fictional poets. And I just, I just didn't care. I'm so sorry, but I just don't care. I do not care about the letter correspondence of fictional poets from the 1800s. I just, I, I don't care. I just do not care. And the problem with that is it means that the other section of the novel, which is set in the 90s, uh, or the, the 80s, I don't know anymore, set in the modern day, and these two poets who develop a relationship because they realize they're studying the corresponding poet, these two academics who realize they're studying the corresponding poet, I should remember their names, that would make it so much easier to describe. Um, but their names are sort of nothing. Maud is the woman, and Roland is the man. And Roland is studying Randolph Harry Ash, Henry Ash, and Maud is studying Christopher Lamont. You see the stuffy English names, half people know. 
the modern day story is basically nothing. The modern day story is flimsy paper thin because there's just not very much to it. The book's more interested in the 1800 story, but the difficulty of weaving that all together is just a lot. It's just it's so much. It's it, it's tough, and you're often waiting to see the story that you want to read unfold, and you're kind of on pause because you're instead reading about disagreements in academic academic faculties, or you're reading about letter correspondence from poets from 200 years ago, right? And I often thought to myself, let's get on with it, get on with it. And this is one of those feelings I get very often when I read big books like this, is not everything is going to be clearly signposted and meaningful for everybody. There's going to be elements which are going to appeal for certain people and just won't for others. And whereas the short book, it doesn't feel as bad because you can finish it quickly and move on, in the long book, you're really in it for the full haul, right? You're really in it to the end, and you need to get through it. And so, in my experience, personally, of reading this book is a 3 out of 5. I think it does very well in illustrating how someone might feel so strongly about Victorian poetry. Like, I was G'd up by the end of it, right? I was reading poems and looking at subtext and enjoying it quite a bit because of how they built this up, and I've not had that feeling towards, say, Browning or say Tennyson, because I didn't have that personal connection with the author in the way that this novel made me have a personal connection with its characters. So to that end, it is a success. And I think, oh, well, is it deserving of the Booker? Sure, why not? <laughs> I feel like I'm very critical of the Booker this month, because I read two Booker, nom two Booker winners, and neither of them have been immensely meaningful for me. But yes, three out of five, that's pleasure. Before I forget to, an interesting sub-theme in this text is how 1800s poetry is not very personal and not very bodily. They tend to be about myths and legends and histories and things that are wholly distant from the author. And what's really good about this book is that it puts the body back into those works and it explains how physical desire and romance might push an author to write about classical mythology and to use elements of mythology to try and describe one's own feelings and emotions. I thought that was very well done. I also love the way that they used uh, Breton mythology and lots of things that I wasn't as familiar with. Norse mythology, uh, the drowned city of East. That was just really, really cool. And lastly, I have forgotten what else I want to say. Okay, book seven of October. This is My Brilliant Friend by Eleanor Ferrante. This was a very easy read and a very enjoyable read. I thought this was just so fantastic. We follow two childhood friends, the protagonist, who has a few different names. She calls herself Elena. Um, her friends call her Lena or Lenu, and she's best friends with a young, young girl, young woman named Leela, whose friends call something else. I have forgotten. There are lots of different names, right? And they're growing up in this little village in Naples. And it's around the mid to late 20th century in this era where this township was quite impoverished and all the families were there on trades. So you have the family of the greengrocers, you have the family of the shoe cobblers, you have the family of this and that. And there was that conflict between getting an education and moving away versus following in the family trade and providing the kinds of services that your local community needs. But the problem is that because of globalization, because of the advancing of technology, it wasn't as necessary to have these old traditional methods anymore. And so there's this undercurrent of larger societal critique and conflicts in this book, which is otherwise the very rich and complex and beautiful coming-of-age story for our protagonists. I really like the way that represents education in particular, and the kinds of conflicts that arise in education, how to measure intelligence, and how people can be intelligent in different ways, and being good at school is one of many valid ways to have a valuable life and to be intelligent. All of the characters in this text engage with school and with coming-of-age in very different ways, and I thought that this was just really, really well handled. I think the relationships were very genuine, the prose was very nice. I was surprised because this is one of the first books I've ever read where the prose itself, 
the stuff between the dialogue, the actual description of what is happening was exceptionally beautiful and was just so well done. Every sentence was pointing towards another point of the plot or another aspect of the character. Every sentence was working really well. You could feel it was carefully done, even though it's translated. I was so surprised and so pleasantly... I don't know how to describe it. I just enjoying it. I just enjoy it the whole way through. And the tense is also well done. It's not linear, but in a very pleasurable way. It does jump a little bit back and forth, but not in a destabilizing way. It, it's just in a way that makes sense for a story being told in retrospect. Like if someone's telling their life story in a linear way, every now and then they'd want to give a little anecdote about something happened in the future, or something happened in the past, and it just feels natural. It feels like you have this very intimate relationship with the narrator, and the narrator is also just being very candid and open about their own childhood experiences. The setting feels re really vivid. There's like 40 or 50 named characters, and all of them have their own personalities, and it's really not hard to follow who is who, and there's lots of great emotional moments. It's surprisingly brutal, surprisingly violent, but I think part of that speaks to the the underlying conflicts of the society, the way the intersecting, the intersecting ideas of class and gender and education function in this text is really enjoyable. And it's a series of four, and this first one is mostly just about the childhood and adolescent years. I don't know what happens in the next few ones, but I am excited to read because this is great. This is a four out of five. Okay, and the last book for this month, it was getting towards Halloween, and so I thought maybe I'd want to read something a bit spooky. And I'd always had The King in Yellow on my shelf. This is a not very well-known horror text from the late 1800s. It is an author who inspired H.P. Lovecraft and is a nice bridge between the kind of gothic horror of Edgar Allan Poe and the cosmic horror of H.P. Lovecraft. This is a collection of short stories about a fictional play called The King in Yellow. And this is a play which is so vivid and evocative and terrifying that it starts driving people who read it uh, insane. And it has these interconnected short stories where characters interact with this play, The King in Yellow, and it illustrates the kind of cosmic horror that literature can have on individuals. And I think the premise is so cool and so understandable because everyone can relate to the feeling of a work of literature altering their view on reality. I think there's so many instances where I've been reading books and then I put the book down and I look around the world around me and the perception I have of the world around me has shifted because of some words on a page. And the conceit of a book who, which can drive its readers insane because of what's, what's contained in it is very believable to me in a sense because I have firsthand experienced improvements or degradations in my own mental health based on what I've read. Earlier this year I read uh, A Little Life and it made my week so much worse. And so the belief in just a very powerful play that can amplify the effects that I already know exists to create horrific, horrific, horrific situations I think is tantalizing. I think it works so well as horror. I will say to preface that this collection is uneven. The first four books are what are commonly cons considered the King and Yellow stories, so The Repair of Reputations, The Mask in the Court of the Dragon, and The Yellow Sign. These are straight horror stories, these stories which all involve The King and Yellow, and also, quite interestingly, are kind of science fiction. So this book is written in the late 1800s, and the first story is set in the 1920s in a sort of messed up version of America with changed laws and changed values. It's not a hard science fiction text, it's not trying to predict the future, but it is set in the future to destabilize how we see our world around us. It's easy to miss that because a book set in the 1920s today is very much a historical text, and it's hard to imagine this as a futurist text, but that is what it is. And the, the first four stories also feature characters who are also already not mentally very well. They already have strangeness in their lives and the introduction of this play just kind of tips them over the edge. I was just really entranced too by the way that the book functions, the King Yellow function, which is the first act is really good. The first act is incredibly compelling to the point that the reader just can't help but, con but continue. 
and we get little excerpts from the text at the beginning of each of these stories. And then when the reader of the King of Yellow, the King of Yellow, gets to Act Two, that is when things start to become horrific, and they start to start seeing visions. And it seems like the imagery of the story is what causes the insanity, because the narratives of each story towards the end start reciting descriptions of things they've seen in their minds in the text. They can't stop. They can't help but see things that they've read about in the, backs of the, in the back of their eyeballs, and that's what creates the, their strange behavior. It works so well, it's really terrifying. It got me thinking about it for so, so long, and I just want to read this excerpt from The King in Yellow from The Mask, and it's a conversation between two characters, Camilla and The Stranger. Camilla says, you, sir, show mask. The Stranger asks, indeed? Camilla says, indeed, it's time. We have all laid aside disguise but you. And the stranger says, I wear no mask. Camilla, terrified, aside to Casilda, uh, no mask, no mask. And that's just, the imagination of what that might look like on stage is horrifying to me. Like a character who, everybody else has been wearing masks the entire time. And he says, no, I'm not wearing a mask. Weird, right? And yeah, if you want to read this book, I would only read the first four stories. The fifth and sixth and seventh story are kind of ghostly, supernatural texts, but they have nothing to do with The King in Yellow, and the tone is hugely shifted as well. These, I would say, are more classical, gothic, spooky romance stories. They're not really even horror stories. I find that the Victorians loved ghost stories, right? The Victorians, as a society that was starting to know more about the world, they were also fascinated in the things that they didn't know. The supernatural, the ghosts, the life after, the life after death, there was no real reverence to these supernatural elements. Instead, it was just them being understandably quite interested in the very few unexplainable things of their universe. Now that science and technology and exploration has explained so much of the world around them. So the possibility of life after the death, the possibility of time travel, the possibility of a work of literature driving someone insane, these are very, very Victorian themes to explore in this horror. And so that's how I would describe uh, Demoiselle Dees and The Prophet's Paradise and the, St the Street of the Four Winds. Those stories have that element of Victorian spookiness. And then there are the last stories, the streets stories. The Street of the First Shell, which is a war story set in the siege of, I want to say Paris, I can't remember what city it is. Then after that, The Street of Our Lady of the Fields is a very standard romance story. And then Rue Barre, which is French for the, the blocked street, is another romance story. These last three stories are bad, <laughs> but just, I tried my best to engage with them. They're, first of all, they're difficult. They're stories where the characters aren't introduced very well. They say their names to each other and it's hard to visualize who is who and who's speaking what and what's happening in each situation. It's just not very well edited. And it got to the point where I tried to understand them. I would open up a word doc to try and map out who the characters were, what their various names were, what happens to them across the story, and I would finish this map and then I would go, no, that's it. That's it. It's the romance story. It's just a war story. There's nothing special about them. And it was such a shame because the first four stories did horror so well that it boggles me that the author then decided towards the end of the book, oh, I'm just not going to do horror anymore. And especially in that conceit as well of The King in Yellow being at first being hyper compelling effective literature and then in the second half driving the audience insane these second half of the stories drove me to exhaustion it was just a lot of effort for not very much payoff and i think most people who pick up this collection feel the same way is that the last couple of stories the street stories aren't worth it but the first four the king and yellow stories are fantastic and how do i rank how do i rate a collection of stories where some of them are very, very good and some of them are very, very bad. I don't know. Three out of five. <laughs> the first four stories are really verging on five out of five. They're such great and novel and unexpected representations of horror. And the later stories are one out of fives. They're painful to read. They're difficult. They don't have any significance. Averages out three out of five. Okay, and that's my stack for October. There are eight books here, four easy, four hard. I thought I could learn a lot. I've learned 
so much about each of the different cultures in these books, different ways of looking at life. Overall, I'd say quite good, even though I didn't find anything that I really loved. Most of these I don't regret reading. The only ones I regret reading are the last stories in the King Yellow. Those are terrible. Don't read them. Everything else, I highly recommend. So that's it for October. I will see you guys in November, and if I get time to it, I will also make some supplementary video about the nature of difficulty in literature, if I get around to it. Okay, thanks for joining, and I will see you next time. Goodbye!